is six o'clock and I will call the fourth regular common council meeting to order. Will the clerk please call the roll for the day? Call the roll. Uh, quote Betty, of the day. Quote of the day, thank you. <laughs> All right, leaders don't force people to follow, they invite them on a journey. All right, will the clerk please call the roll? Alderperson Ackley. Here. Alderperson Decker. Here. Alderperson Feldy. Here. Alderperson Felicki Paneski. Here. Alderperson Heideman. Here. Alderperson Mitchell. Here. Alderperson Perella. Here. Alderperson Salazar. Here. Alderperson Rust. Here. There are nine present. All right, thank you. For everyone in attendance, if you're able to stand, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Next is approval of the minutes from our previous meeting. Alder Feldy. Thank you, Mayor. I move to approve. Second. Been a motion and second. Any discussion on the minutes from our previous meeting? Seeing none, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Any opposition? Minutes are approved. Next item four is confirmation of mayoral appointments. Alder Feldy. I move to confirm. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Please refer to your Muni code. Oh, All right, it, I'm up, I guess. Um, wait. I move that all candidates. Nope. Wait. wait. Nope. 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 Okay. Wait. They're still voting for the for the mayor appointments. I move. Wait. No. Nope. Nope. Okay. Nope. I'm lost. Oh, We're just waiting cool. for people to vote. We're still waiting for Alder Feldy, Flicky Paneski, and Heidemann to vote. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're good, Joe. Mm -hmm. I got it. Nine eyes. All right, that is approved. Next is item five, election to fill the vacancy for Alder in Alder District 5. Alder Feldy? I call for a motion to open up the floor for nominations. I call for a motion to open up nominations nope. from... <laughs> You're the second one, Barb. Open up nominations. Sorry about that. Second. No, I move. She's no. got to read that second paragraph. Yeah. Have to read this one. <clears throat> okay. I move. I move that all candidates who provided applications to the city clerk are hereby nominated Angela Ram Ramy and Josh Fick. Voting will be done by open ballot. The candidate with the majority of votes will be elected. Second. Is there second. a second? There's been second. a motion and second to provide all applications, all applications that are provided. And there's been a second. All right. First, we'll call up the candidates who've submitted their application uh, for uh, the position. First, we'll have Angela Ramey. If you just want to come, just ask the candidates to speak for th three to four-ish minutes. So if you can come up to the podium, just state your name and give an introduction. Hello. My name is Angela Ramey, and it is a privilege to be here to ask for your support for the District 5 seat on the Common Council. Next spring will mark my 10th year of residency in Sheboygan. I moved here from Appleton, Wisconsin to start my career at the John Michael Kohler Arts Center, where I am currently the Performing Arts Program Director. 
I'm a mother of two young daughters and just welcomed my retired parents as they relocated to be closer to us. My family and I have lived in District 5 for eight years and we are proud to call Sheboygan our home. My role at JMKAC has allotted me the opportunity to work with different city departments throughout the years. Most notably would be my role in the planning and implementing of the Levitt Amp Sheboygan Music Series, which continues to bring our community together as we gather on the city green on Thursday nights all summer long. I have seen firsthand tremendous progress we can make when we work together with local businesses, organizations, and city departments to build community. Seeing this impact is at the core of why I chose to be in the nonprofit sector. As a lifelong learner, I am excited for the opportunity to study more about how our city operates and how I can use my years of experience and education to assist in the work that you have all been doing to make sure Sheboygan continues to be a great place to live, work, and play. I plan to fully engage in the district, invite conversation, and discover what the District 5 constituents need for their best quality of life. Thank you all for your time and consideration. I humbly ask for your vote and would look forward to serving beside you on behalf of the citizens of District 5. Thank you. Next is Joshua Fick. Hello, everybody. Hello, Angela. <laughs> we live like four houses down, uh -huh. never even realized that that's who I was running against. Um, so my name is Josh Fick. I have lived in Sheboygan for 34 years, attended local schools, um, and now have five kids in the community um, who are also attending our local public schools. Um, and when I got the opportunity to um, run for this position, I got asked about it. And I was really excited because a couple years ago I ran for the school board. I wanted to help there. Um, that ended up not working out. So then this opportunity came up. And I feel that it, um, it was almost just a calling that, okay, I still need to be involved with my community some way, somehow. Um, and with having five kids and growing up in this community, um, I've seen it turn into a great place. But I believe there are some things that we could do um, to make it even better. Um, and I believe with me growing up in this community and raising my kids in it now, I get to see all that Sheboygan has to offer. Um, I've worked at the same job for the last 24 years. Um, I started there when I was 10, washing trucks, emptying garbage, doing all the stuff, and now I'm in sales. Um, and I sell janitorial supplies, and I travel all over the United States, so I get to see a lot of different cities and what they're doing um, as far as helping their communities. Um, I've lived in District 5 for the, um, and next week will be eight years that I've been there, but I've been in Sheboygan my entire life. Um, and I really believe I can help the community um, and bring some positive stuff um, to Sheboygan. Um, I ask you guys for your vote on this and um, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All the candidates having spoken, will the clerk please distribute the paper ballots? And then for the elders, once you are done, uh, please just raise them up and then uh, Meredith will collect them from you. And then I'm going to run because the former elder sent something and it just got released from the spam.
right. I believe all ballots have been received. Uh, the clerk will call uh, the roll of the votes. Okay. For Rami, we have Ackley, Decker, Feldy, Felicki, Paneski, Perella, Rust, and Salazar. And for Fick, we have Heidemann and Mitchell. All right. So have a, having a majority have voted, Angela Rami has been appointed and elected to Older District 5. Congratulations. So it's a very shotgun approach of how we do this. So you'll come on up and the clerk will administer the oath. Oh, just a second though, I gotta get to it. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, hi. Raise your right hand. Hi, Angela Ramey. Hi, Angela Ramey. Having been elected? Having been elected. To the Office of Alder Person District 5. To the Office of Alder Person District 5. Swear that I will support. Swear that I will support. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And will faithfully discharge. And will faithfully, faithfully discharge. The duties of said office. The duties of said office. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right, so we have a few presentations today. First is by Brayden. Uh, if you want to come up to the, the podium, and Brayden will do an introduction of his presentation. All right, so my name is Brayden Schmidt. I live in uh, District 2. I moved to Sheboygan four or five years ago now, officially. And um, I work for Kohler Company. I do market research and category strategy. And so as part of that job, I work with lots of data to understand market trends and needs. And I'm held accountable um, to how we meet those needs by measuring the financial performance of my category. So we're going to talk about affordable and sustainable development. And as we go through that, um, we're just going to kind of start off with how to measure the financial performance of what is your category, which is all of the, the land within the boundaries of the city. So I'll just start off with the presentation. All right, so we'll look at two commercial properties first just to kind of understand what I'm talking about when I, when I look at measuring value. And the first part is just actual assessed value. It's pulled off of the city's website, the property assessments, because when it comes to the revenue that the city generates, it comes from property taxes. So we'll look at that assessed value. Look at Meyer, that's $13.7 million. Also creates value as an employer, two to 300 jobs is the average for a Meyer grocery store according to their corporate website. Three businesses technically on that property because there's Meyer, and then within there there's a Kohler Credit Union and Starbucks. 1503 North 8th is a much smaller building, much lower cost, $82,800 is the assessed value. Three to five jobs, a couple on either side. There's two businesses, one on each side, and there is also one two-bedroom apartment on the top. So when you look at this, it's kind of hard to, to compare the value of these two places because they are so different, but they're both within the city. They're both using land and resources and infrastructure. So if you're going to compare these, you have to look at it as how effectively they use that land. The best way to do that is on a per acre basis. Look at the value of this place per acre. So per acre, Meyer creates $964,000 of value, about 14 to 21 jobs. There's no housing, but we kind of already knew that, and there is just that one business then if you're doing it on a per acre basis. 1503 North 8th, though, because it's this small compact building on a small lot, two stories, doing a lot of different things, creates $3 million per acre. It would have room for 90 to 150 jobs if you had an acre of these types of buildings, 33 two-bedroom apartments, and room for 66 small businesses. So it would take four and a half acres of buildings like 1503 North 8th to create the equal value of Myers' 14 plus acres and providing 50% you know, more jobs and 150 two-bedroom units. So it's not like we can just you know, plop these down anywhere and call it valuable, but it just helps understand how useful and valuable places that use their space effectively and efficiently are. We have lots of buildings like this in our downtown, kind of run through and you can see these different places like 902 on the avenue, that's a bar and grill on one floor, apartment on the second floor, $3.8 million. One of the five, top five most valuable places on a per acre basis in the city is Legend Larry's, $5.9 million. They make incredible use of their space. And all of these buildings have 
one thing in common, they're all old. They've all been around for generations, generating that wealth for the city for generations. And part of that is that they're flexible. They can change over time to meet the needs of the community. Like the building in the top left has been you know, a vacuum store and a bike shop, and now there's offices on the first or on the second floor and coffee shop on the first. These things can change to meet the community over, community's needs over time. Big box stores, kind of like the one that we just showed you with Meyer, can't really do that as well. They start off initially less valuable and then depreciate over time. Like Walmart operates on the 15 to 20 year depreciation cycle. So what that means is they try and depreciate their buildings down to zero so they don't have to pay as much property tax and then they move on to a different building eventually. So these reached the end of their life. You can see Shopco, 2019 was the last year it was open, $238,000 on a per acre basis. So that's 25 times less valuable than Legend Larry's. So just another quick example, we have a lot of quick trips, so here's a quick trip. And then here's a, a little piece of land on North 8th Street, this is near where I live. Um, none of these mixed use buildings have shops in the front anymore, but they still have apartments. The quick trip cranks out $650,000 per acre. These underused buildings create $850,000 per acre. So even though they're not being used to the, their highest capacity, they're still creating more value on a per acre basis than something like a quick trip. So small mixed use buildings are more effective than big box stores when it comes to value and how they use that space. But I just kind of want to like set that stage of, of measuring by value per acre. We're going to talk about housing most because we have housing crisis and every time I come to any sort of meeting, this is, this is happening or being talked about, whether it be the SEDC or you guys or the Chamber of Commerce, everybody's talking about the fact that we need to build more housing. So I want to compare different types of housing on a per acre basis as well. Single family versus mixed residential. So what that means is just single family homes versus a mix of single family homes and a couple duplexes, maybe a small apartment building. We'll look at two different spots, a newer subdivision and an older one. They're about the same size in terms of the area that I'm looking at here, 5.15 and 4.92 acres. The newer one, obviously more expensive. The older one, less expensive. Buildings become cheaper over time for the most part. Um, but even though this one is more expensive, because it's not making as effective use of the land, it's creating less value per acre, 50% less value than these traditional homes. So they're you know, sitting on the same amount of infrastructure, the same amount of cost, but there's more value created in this sort of mixed use traditional development. And it also can become more affordable over time as these have. The one on the left won't be able to become as affordable because you can't walk to get places. It's not as easy to get on a bus and use that. It's unlikely that you would live here without um, at least a car, if not two or three, and you can see that they're built with two or three car garages, kind of having that, meeting that need in mind. So if you live here, you will always have to own a car. So it will never become quite as affordable as these other places. So we still build mixed residential developments though. So you can see an example here of, once again, the traditional one, and then a newer one that has a couple of condos, a side-by-side -side duplex or two, and some single family homes kind of all mixed together. But this one, not quite as walkable, doesn't have a sidewalk, and then also, not quite at that same value per acre. And it's still not that close either. It's about a 50% difference. That's a lot. That's also a pun because lot size is a big part of that. You know, the traditional neighborhoods have a lot size of around 0.15 acres. Um, so if you were to do some sort of development with a lot size from a traditional neighborhood, and you sprinkle in some different flexible housing options, I have some examples I'll share with you, and then add some mixed use, like what we just saw before, you can have like a shop or a, you know, a nail salon, whatever, within a walkable distance, it can add some one value per acre and also make a place more walkable. So here's an example. I'll show you a few from this study out of Chattanooga. This is a, a traditional size lot and they took two little cottages and put them on there. So instead of being a duplex that's connected side by side, it's just two kind of single family units. So when I think about this, when I think about where I live, which is on the northeast side, sort of near where the Aurora Hospital is and where that will be redeveloped, Something like this would be great in that neighborhood. A lot of my neighbors have lived there longer than I've been alive, like 30, 40, 50 years, and their homes aren't built to be lived in when you're getting into your 80s. They have second floor bedrooms, they have cast iron tubs, they might have like a walk-in shower or something like that. But if you want to downsize or get to a place that fits your needs better, you're probably gonna have to move out of that neighborhood. You're gonna uproot from the place where you've built your life. So this is an opportunity to build these kinds of places. It's just a small one-story cottage. You can see that back one has a long walkway to it. You can make an ADA accessible ramp pretty easily to get to those. And it still has that kind of single family feel. You have the privacy, you have your own walls, but you can fit two of these on one spot. You help decrease the cost because you're putting two of these on one lot. And for each of these, I'll just show you a quick picture of what that could look like, a small cottage. Another one would be something like this. You could put it on a corner if you wanted a mixed use. We have corner stores in my neighborhood as well right now. 
There's one that's a, a hairdresser that's been there for a long time. So this is like a single family home in the front, a little backyard cottage type thing in the back, and then attached to it's a little live workspace that could be your work from home office, that could be your you know, a small grocery store, whatever you want it to be. It could look something like this. You do a cottage court if you put two of these lots together, do something like that. Or if you really wanted to have um, more housing and really focus on that without getting something out of scale with a neighborhood, you could do something like this where you have a few duplexes near each other and make a little kind of cottage court but two stories tall. So these are all cool examples that I wanted to share with you. Um, but every single one is uh, part of this 80-page guide on missing middle housing that the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee pulled together. And it came with complete estimated cost of constructions for the different plans, different codes that they go with, residential building, international building code, pro formas for how to get financing for these. Um, none of these would be legal to build under our current zoning codes in the city. Uh, so whether it be the, the setback requirements or the parking requirements or the maximum density or uh, dwelling units per acre, none of these meet those requirements. So there's a little collage of other places, some taller, some smaller, that also would not be able to be built legally in the city today without variances. And we have places like this existing. Uh, I went on a little walk through my neighborhood. Here's two cottages on one lot and a duplex in a residential neighborhood and a little cottage that's only accessed by the alley. Here's another duplex in a residential neighborhood and then this little corner store that's an apartment up top and the hair salon on the first floor. Even my block, which is just single family homes, um, it's, it's zoned SR5, Suburban Residential 5. Five standing for five dwelling units per acre. My block is just under an acre, about 0.92, and there are 12 single family homes on it. So that's 13 dwelling units per acre. That's two and a half times what the limit is for that zone. And that actually exceeds the limit on even our most lenient code, was it urban residential 12, UR 12, 12 dwelling units per acre. So this is considered too high of a density to legally allow anywhere in the city today without variances. And this is what my neighborhood looks like. Um, there's only one lot on this block that meets the minimum lot size requirement today, 6,000 square feet. The rest are 5,000 or less. It's also a really productive neighborhood on a value per acre basis. It's $1.5 million per acre, um, but there's 12 homes, so it's $130,000 per lot, which is how we were able to afford a house there. But if I were buying today, I could not afford to buy the home that I live in now, not even close. It was a stretch to begin with. Um, this is a desirable type of housing. There's a shortage of it, and part of what contributes to that is that it's been illegal to construct neighborhoods like this for decades. Um, there aren't tons of issues, not a big crime issue. Here's the crime map from the past two years. I pulled off the city website, that's my block. Um, that block that I showed you with a couple duplexes on it is right here, so it's not like being close together is causing a swell of crime. I know that there's some concerns when you have that kind of density, but I don't think it's necessarily that the type of housing or how close we are together that, that contributes to that. We can kind of look out for each other as well. If someone walks past to get in my neighbor's backyard, they're walking past my window, and I know that Jim and Kathy aren't going to their backyard at two in the morning, so there's some, some eyes on the street and some natural surveillance that comes along with that. So I love where I live. I think it's a great place. I don't think making more places like this should be you know, outside of what's legal in our zoning codes. But for decades, it has been. So what we've been able to do is build what's legal, where you buy the land on the edge and kind of spread out, where you can have the right lot sizes and the right setbacks, the right dwellings per acre and the right parking minimums. But the trade-offs of lower value per acre and more infrastructure and service liabilities as you kind of spread out higher carbon emissions because you have to drive everywhere, and then more impermeable services as you pave more parking lots and streets, and then you kind of stack the deck in favor of these big boxes that aren't as productive as our local small businesses. And I'll show you an example of that. Here's a Stonebrook subdivision. Eventually, there'll probably be a bus line out there, but right now there's not. You still, it won't be as easy to take a bus as it is to drive at any point there. So you'll likely drive. If you wanted to get downtown, put me public library in the map. It's a 13 minute drive, kind of in the middle of downtown. It would be much easier for you to shop at Deer Trace Mall in Kohler or to go downtown Sheboygan Falls. That would only take you 11 minutes compared to 13 for our downtown. Or you could go to Oostburg in 10 minutes. So by stacking it out there on the edge, it makes it easier for them to go and shop anywhere but our downtown. So the problem is that we've been building these kind of financially unproductive housing types, these lower values per acre, in locations that don't encourage patronizing your most valuable places, where you need a car to survive and that have these proportionally higher infrastructure and service costs. And we've been doing this for a generation, and that has some negative effects. So here's a map of Sheboygan in 1960. Here's this is, you can see the voting words on there, so you can see how that's changed, it's kind of neat. Here's a map today. You can see what's been added out on the edges. It's a lot of those kind of larger subdivisions, kind of the swirly, curvy lots, 
And then also all these big box stores like Taylor Drive and South Business Drive and the strip malls and things like that that are lower value per acre. So here's what it was, here's where we are. To understand that again, you know, this kind of sprawl that we've done, in 1960, our population was about 46,000 people. We had 108 miles of roadway to maintain. And then all the pipes and fire protection and water and all things that go along with that. Now our population is about 49.9, so about a 10% increase. But we've nearly doubled the miles of roadway. So we've built out all of this infrastructure and we haven't built the wealth needed to sustain it. So when you see the backlog of, of work that needs to be done and the roads that are in poor shape, this is a huge contributing factor, the fact that we've added all this without adding what we need to sustain it. But it's not all bad news, right? We've done some pretty incredible infill lately, utilizing spaces that previously were underutilized or used a different way. So taking advantage of the existing roads and infrastructure that we already have there, making upgrades as they're needed. Like South Pier, so I don't have a living memory of South Pier ever being a coal dock, but that just blows my mind when I see that kind of side by side. Here's this spot, it's now High Point. High Point's the single highest value per acre property in the entire city. Seven Penn is up there as well. Uh, so we've been knocking out these huge projects and as we kind of go through our different affordable housing studies and things like that, there's always this mention of how easy it is for us to work with developers and that kind of reputation that we have of working well with them. So we've been knocking out things like High Point and Seven Pen and the Oscar and all these different huge projects. But you can't just have this giant hammer in your toolbox, you gotta have some other tools. Because a small project, these, these little things, aren't worth the time of a large developer. But a small would-be developer or a landlord or someone like that doesn't have the know-how or the time or the ability to take on the risk to go through all those processes to get variances and things like that. So it's about adding these smaller fine-grained tools to kind of fill in the gaps. And we have a lot of gaps. Whether it be like city-owned, underutilized lots like this one on South 12th. I, I, I grabbed a bunch of empty parking lots here that are just underutilized where there's empty buildings and things like that or just empty lots in general where there's spots they'd be filled in if it was rezoned and the zoning laws were changed to make it possible to do that. This is my personal favorite. I like King Walk, it's one of my favorite food trucks. Uh, they used to have a restaurant in the strip mall. This is such a desolate, barren wasteland of a parking lot. They no longer serve food out of there. They park their food truck out at the edge of the parking lot near Calumet Avenue. So to kind of address this, you need to prioritize that missing middle development. So that stuff that I showed you that's kind of in between a single family home and a big tall apartment building. All those little things like affordable condos, starter homes, senior housing, mixed use buildings. Focus that on infill and areas that already have some amenities. And you look at publicly owned property first because you can directly impact that. And then reform the zoning codes to legalize that kind of affordable productive development. So allowing multifamily by right, adjusting minimum setbacks and parking requirements and maximum dwellings per acre. And I'm reading through this really fast because these aren't my ideas. These are all from our website. We pulled this off of our own affordable housing market study, the types of units that are needed, and the location being infill, and the, the types of zoning reforms that are needed, and then kind of mapped out spots over these could go. Look at our sustainability plan. It's kind of the same thing, where it talks about compact neighborhoods with mixed uses and mixed housing types, affordable housing with multi-unit and single-family homes, so getting that mix, having multiple uses in an area to make it more walkable, more desirable place to live and work, and then focusing first on redeveloping underutilized buildings and strip centers and parking lots. So I didn't really do any of this myself. Value per acre analysis is done all over the country. Um, so I kind of knew what I was looking for when I did that. Just pulled it into Excel off our city website. It was super easy. So whoever set that up to make it easy to pull off, thank you for that. Um, and then I just kind of took the time to, to go through these reports. But like, if you guys spent enough time to read every single report that you're handed, nothing would get done. And I don't just mean the council, like this is a lean organization. So it's difficult to, to pull all that together. This took me a long time, slowly over time, just piecing this piece by piece. But part of what motivated me to do this was seeing that this, there's this property being purchased on the south side of the city, which like, you know how I feel about sprawl already. So it's probably the time when I should tell you this was a bad idea, but I don't think it was. I think this is a really incredible opportunity because the city is going to have control of this land. It can decide how you're going to use it. So you can make the kind of changes that you need to the zoning laws or to the setup of this, decide to work, focus on infill and then spread out over here as you need space, et cetera. Maybe you need space right now when you kind of figure that out, all that. But you have the opportunity to control that. It's not you know, at the whim of a developer. But it'd be really easy to get this wrong. You can look at the, the place just to the left of it. We have the, those kind of subdivisions with cul-de-sacs. I pulled the value per acre of that subdivision. It's $435,000, which is half of that traditional neighborhood I showed you that was kind of mixed 
and it's a third of my neighborhood, which is you know, much smaller lots than even the traditional one I showed you before. Um, anyone can, can do this. All the towns and villages around here can, can do this better than us. They have more space. They can spread out in more directions. Um, and they also haven't had the decades of development compounding in terms of the, the infrastructure costs that we now have to face as we deal with replacing pipes and roads and things like that. And also, they don't have those unproductive big box stores to the same extent that we do. They can drive in and shop at Meyer on the Edge or Festival or Walmart, which we pay for the infrastructure of to maintain, but then the sales tax from that goes out to the county and gets redistributed. So we're stacking the deck against ourselves if we build something like this. This is really a, a great place to build for someone in, in like the town of Sheboygan. They can build this, it'll be new, it'll have lower taxes. Now, if we build the state, it'll be desirable because it's new, but it will never be anything other than what it is, and it will never become as affordable as something that's more walkable, like I kind of talked about. So a blank slide here, just so I can kind of talk for a second, in case I haven't talked enough. Um, this is the hard part, because this is where the work needs to get done. Um, first, there's, there's not many places that have kind of done the research that the city has already pulled together. So there aren't a ton of places that I, have, that I can point to as like success stories yet. We're all kind of hitting this at the same time. Um, those who have figured this out often struggle to make changes, specifically in these more suburban areas that feel this pain earlier. They don't have that same inherited kind of wealth that we have. They don't have the productive downtown. They don't have these traditional neighborhoods that already have these different types of housing baked into it. So just like us, they need all these different types of housing. They need the tall apartments. They also need the single family homes and they need these kind of in-between things. But where are you gonna put a six-story apartment if all you have is sprawling suburbs? Like, we have spots where you can put those. We have spots where you can put duplexes where we already have them in these different neighborhoods. So we kind of have the deck stack in our favor a little bit there. And then the final thing here is, I think there's probably even fewer places where a conversation like this could happen. Um, do you know who I am? The answer is largely no, because I'm not anybody. I don't have many connections. Anybody who knows who I am knows me because I've emailed you in like the past couple of weeks or months. It's like Todd and uh, Ryan and Chad and Roberta, thank you for responding to my emails and setting it up so I could have this kind of conversation and have the chance to share this with you. So I appreciate your time and the, the chance to, to talk about this and share what I was able to pull together. Thanks. Thanks, Braden. Any questions from Alders? Roberta, I see you reaching for it. All I said was, wow, uh, I appreciate it. I recognized all of the homes in my district, so thank you for that. Um, as you were going through, I was thinking, who else should we put this man in front of? And um, the, the nearest in my mind is the six plus acres that uh, Memorial Hospital will be vacating. So, and, and that is the neighborhood. So, um, we'll get you an appointment with Memorial Hospital. <laughs> so, uh, I love that. That yeah. can work. That can work. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All their sales are. Um, I'm also going to echo the wow. So, thank you for sort of. Um, I guess bringing this to our attention, I guess I'll be honest with you as an alder, we have um, a lot sort of flying at us. Sorry, Angela. <laughs> um, and so I appreciate you sort of doing the work that we've already implemented or that we've put out there as a city. And it's great to sort of see, have somebody with fresh eyes sort of bring that back to us um, and sort of kind of spotlight some, some of the things that we have already said as a, as a unit and really sort of refresh our mind of how to think differently about sort of some of our spaces. I think for a while there, we've kind of just been scratching our heads and leaning at the team members that we have here, but I appreciate you sort of bringing back the conversation to the table. Um, and I hope that my fellow alders here also appreciate that and that we can sort of talk about this um, and really sort of dig into it and see what we can do and make some changes because housing is an issue on many fronts. So thank you. Thanks, Alder Salazar. Other alders, Alder Prella. Yes, so I want to echo that. I mostly I really appreciate that you took the time for doing this and to to be so thorough about it and do the work for us as well. So I, I really thank you for that, Brendan. 
Thanks for those comments. Alder Decker. Yes, I guess I, I, I would like to echo those th those comments also. And I'd like to thank you just for uh, giving us the opportunity to look outside the box. Um, I think that's something that we're going to have to do in the future with some of these things. I think that we're, you know, we, we, we can't keep doing things exactly the same way. So thank you. Thank you, Alder Decker. Uh, Alder Sal's our follow up. Sorry, I'm going to come back to it. Um, so quickly, uh, off the top of your head, like I guess some of the things that you were highlighting, are there sort of, uh, if you could just like reiterate maybe like the next three steps or things that you think we could implement um, that could easily impact some of this change? Yeah, so I think the, the, the best thing is just look at these historic neighborhoods, these places where you have that kind of incongruence between what exists there today and what the current zoning law says there is. So for example, where I live, you know, the minimum lot size does not reflect the reality of the neighborhood. The, the maximum dwellings per acre does not reflect the um, neighborhood. And then maybe you look at the, the allowance of duplexes by right because there are duplexes scattered throughout. So it'd be just those kind of changes, like look at what exists today and just allow that to continue to be built. You don't need to like change the way a neighborhood looks or acts or works. I don't think many people would, would want their neighborhoods to change. They oftentimes bought them because of the way that they are. Just make it legal to continue to build places like that. And currently, sorry, I'm going to follow up. Currently, we're saying that is illegal, right? Is that what you're saying? So there are a number of things on my block that, that made it illegal to, to build without variances, yeah. So and like, that's still current now? Yeah, yes. Okay. Thank you. Holder Feldy. Brayden, that was an excellent presentation you did. Um, uh, I even asked <laughs> Alderperson Flicky Paninsky um, who you were. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> but but I'm impressed. And um, for all the years that I've been on this council, I have talked about affordable. Um, everybody's definition of affordable housing seems to be different, so um, keep with it and keep pushing for the affordable and I, I, I will be there with you. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Feldy. Additional comments from Alders? I'll allow this exception, Alder Salazar. Sorry, I know I only get two. Can yeah. you share your presentation with us? Yeah, absolutely. Thank I'll, you. I'll have to compress it because I tried to send it today and it was too big to share, so. I appreciate I'll create that. an abbreviated Too many version. animations. Yeah, yeah, too many, the dramatic animations, yes. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm done. Sorry. Additional uh, comments from Alders. <laughs> Seeing that no one else is buzzed in, thank you, Braden. Appreciate yeah. it. And also, thank you to whoever actually did all the work that pulled those plans together because it's incredible work. It's like I read reports for a living, and that's good stuff. All right. We'll take a quick intermission. I'm kidding, no. Next, uh, Administrator Wolf will introduce uh, for our next presentation from our friends at Ehlers. Come on up, gentlemen. Oh, you can use that one. You guys pointed to each other, I thought. <laughs> hey, I don't care. <laughs> All right, so I would like to introduce Ehlers. Um, we're gonna have David Ferris, who is basically the backbone of the, of the data and information, and his uh, cohort, Phil Coulson, uh, Coulson, from the south side of Sheboygan originally. But we won't talk about that. What I did want to point out is uh, back in 2021, we talked about the, and actually having the city do a strategic financial uh, plan so that when we look at our borrowing year over year, we would have an actual five-year strategic plan. The city of Sheboygan has never done that. I called an audible and really made David happy, and we changed it from a five-year to a 10-year. So one of the things that um, many of the alders may re recall is the fact that we do our, our five-year capital improvements program. So for five years, we basically look at our first year that we're gonna be borrowing next, meaning next year, and then the four consecutive years after. So we have kind of an, un, an understanding of what our debt or projects are for up to five years. We're going to be looking at 10 years in the future. Because we are a city of the age that we are, we have so many projects that have not been brought forward. So in today's 
presentation, we're going to talk about quite a few projects. This is borrowing only, and it's just kind of a starting point. It's the foundation of where do we need to look and what do we need to look at. We've been very conservative in our borrowing. We've been really balancing our balance sheet, no pun intended, and we've been really working hard in having more of a strategic plan on where are we going and what do we need to fix and what are the priorities. So part of that goal is going to be having these gentlemen explain this program. It's, a, it's just the, the very first round and then we can pretty much adjust it year over year moving forward. So I'll pass the, pass the baton. All right, thank you. <laughs> Mayor, council members, good evening. Phil Cosson with Ellers, nice to be with you again. Uh, we have the, I think we have the presentation up as well. And you have a hard copy as well, I believe. As uh, Minister Wolf indicated, uh, this is not the final product. Uh, first of all, I, I want to really start by saying uh, we hope this is a document they read as well, okay? It's not all plans get shelved, uh, but uh, this is not the final document. This is really step one in the capital look. So we're, we, we were contracted to do a kind of long-range planning for the city. We're not just looking at your capital. We're also going to be coming back and talking about your operating needs as well long-term. Not 10 years, but five years in that case. This is our first attempt at, at really putting together a capital plan over a 10-year period that, one, meets the needs of the city and brings forth uh, not just your ongoing capital like streets and equipment, but some of those legacy projects that are kind of on the horizon that we want to make sure are incorporated into the plan. So we spent quite a bit of time talking with city staff uh, to make sure that those legacy projects were put in place uh, in this plan. And day, later on, Dave will go through some of those items. Some of those legacy projects you'll hear about are the DPW building, uh, harbor improvements, uh, fire station uh, remodel, uh, are some of the projects that, that you'll see that are listed here. This is not the wish list, we'll start by saying. You, sometimes we come forward with a what it's called, the wish list. Everybody puts everything they want to be done, all the department heads. This is really more of a structure of what we think you've done up to this point, and then build off of that uh, what we are the items that we need, know, that we know need to get done. So we don't have an escalator for like road projects and, and things like that. So there may be coming forward a wish list and then we can show you the differences between those. So on this first, what we hope to accomplish when we go through this is one, establish where you are today. That's kind of what we call the base case. So before you take on any new capital borrowing, uh, where are you today? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Dave will talk a little bit about the actual 10-year capital project list which again include all those equipment and street projects you do annually and those a little more reach projects, the, those legacy projects that are on, on the horizon. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, structure of debt. Uh, the city's been very conservative over the last couple of decades in how you structure your debt. You've done 10 year notes, which is great. It's a quick payback. You pay back less interest, you have flexibility, uh, but um, in some cases where you have an asset that is gonna last a long time, uh, we will look at structuring that debt out over a longer period. Uh, if you're doing a, a major remodel of a fire station or a remodel of the DPW building, we're gonna to wanna to look to stretch it out over a little longer time period uh, to match the asset life. We also gotta talk a little bit about uh, tax levy and tax rates. Ultimately, it's great to put together a plan, but you need to know the impact of those plans financially to the city, and we do, do boil it down to both levy and tax rate. And then the city does have a, uh, a cap uh, that's in place right now on, their, on the use of debt limit for borrowing debt limit as 60%. We'll show you where you are today uh, on that debt limit and kind of where this 10-year plan takes you on that debt limit as well. So, as well. so with that, on to the next page. Uh, I've touched on a few of these already, but again, uh, what we do know for sure is that these projects will move around. We want a flexible plan that enables, enables you to move projects uh, year in and year out. Things will, will be on the list that have to get moved up for various reasons. One reason can certainly be 
a water, major water main break or something, and then that prompts possibly moving a project up on the list. So we want flexibility. Again, we want the flexibility to take on these legacy projects that I just mentioned, and we'll talk about in more detail. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a plan that allows us the flexibility to bring in other funding when available. Things like grants, uh, different fees, use of tax increment financing potentially to fund some projects as well. And then ultimately what we hope comes out of this uh, is that the knowledge and that we can then reestablish if need be some of those policies and goals uh, working collectively with you. Uh, one thing we want to put on the table, because we heard about it meeting with uh, staff earlier, uh, the department heads, is that, uh, like it or not, debt is kind of part of the game. Um, it's, uh, under levy limits, there are, are very r r significant restrictions on how you can raise capital. And when you have large capital items, uh, debt is part of the game that, that are, you're going to be uh, focused on. So we are going to be focused on uh, that element of it today. So the base case I'll just touch on real quick, and that's the next slide that we had in the packet. The base case, all the numbers are on the first uh, page, uh, and then the second page uh, is the uh, is kind of some of the information regarding the base case. And I'm just going to take you left to right through this very quickly, uh, and then we'll build off of this. Uh, in the first column, that's your existing debt, your general obligation debt. So not debt related to the water and sewer utility, but rather general obligation debt. Uh, you have your total obligations identified in the yellow column. After that, we have a number of columns of abated sources that come from the, where some other source of funds are paying for some of the debt. In your case, the primary source is tax increment financing, where you've gone out and, and borrowed for tax increment finance projects. Uh, there's increment that's coming back to pay the debt service on those projects now. So we ultimately get to the total abated sources amount. The net debt service levy is where you end up levying against uh, all the different property tax uh, pairs of the city. So you take that net debt, uh, debt service levy divided by the total value of the community, and you get to the second column from the right, which is the debt service tax rate. So that tax rate is where you are today, $1.22 per thousand uh, for 2022. And you can see over the next couple of years, even without taking on any new capital, uh, you're going to see an increase to $1.36 and then start dropping off after that. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a hill we got to overcome with this long range capital plan because our goal through this process is to work with you uh, putting together uh, a debt levy number that you can live with so we don't have kind of this roller coaster effect. One year it's up, next year it's down, next year it's up, but rather stable over time and we can build out the model to show you that, uh, which we'll do in a little bit. So that's kind of setting the stage where you are today. Uh, again, we've taken uh, the information provided by staff up to this point to start to build out that 10-year capital list Again, it's not a reach list. It's what you need to get done at this point. And then um, I'll let Dave take you from there. I noticed on the prompt uh, that it said that Phil was Dave. And, and I think he'd probably be complimented for that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, just, just to kind of walk you through where we've been. I mean, Phil kind of set the table a little bit. But I, I'm sitting here with a really tiny tiny print list of all the projects that the staff provided to us. I believe it's being considered at, at a meeting either today or, or in the future. But this list has basically all your projects for the next 10 years, uh, broken up by department, broken up by how we're going to fund it, um, and really just an amount, in some cases, just a, a place holding for the future. But we really have, in this one, it's so detailed that you get down to, you know, where, you know, what like Phil was talking about, where there's other funding, whether it's your America Rescue funding or your or your impact fees or things like that. Those are all listed in here. You've got a couple different sources that pay for it. So really, at the point that we received this from the, the city, um, like, like uh, Phil said, we started with five years. Uh, staff decided that it, it might be a better presentation to 
to bring on the next five years at least because there's some projects out there that have never been presented to the city council before. And it was something that was important to have it at least in front of you so that you're considering what might be down the road that might impact you. So we've, we got the best estimates of what those numbers would be, summarized it by department. And, and like Phil said, we've always used general obligation debt at, for uh, notes that is. And, and really, like I told staff earlier, notes pay back faster. It's something that the rating agencies like to do, but in some cases we're using 10-year notes that maybe have an uh, asset with a useful life of maybe 20 years or so, and we aren't, nat we aren't naturally matching that, that useful life uh, with those repayments. And, and I, I think generational, uh, generational, what was the second word? Intergenerational equity, equity yes. Uh, was brought up and, and really the, the thrust behind that is is that whoever's using the asset is the one that's paying for it. Uh, we, uh, we understood in the past there was a lot of funding with cash and really what that ends up doing is the person that lives here today pay for all of that asset and the person in the future doesn't get that benefit. And if you look at it a different way, it could be that person that paid for it all moved away and doesn't get that benefit. So it's kind of something where you can use that debt as a way to have the actual user you, that's using the asset pay for it as well. Uh, the capitalist has uh, some one-time items, as was talked about before, a remodel of a fire station, a DPW addition, a transit building addition, uh, harbor projects, some of the things that were added after we got through with the first five years. Uh, going on to the next slide, I'm not going to go through every number, don't worry. Uh, basically what this did is it summarized all of the borrowing items that was in that big list that I talked about <laughs> into these certain items that were in the plan. So we summarized it by basically the department, some of them are, are, are in, in here in order of like the bond uh, statutory purpose, but we tried to summarize it down so this document, it's two pages long uh, with all this kind of shows you exactly all the things that are in here. Uh, you take those project costs per year, uh, there's some issuance costs, and basically that golden box down on the bottom is where we get to the size per issue that we tried to take that and then structure it in such a way that we could come up with a flexible plan for you, and we'll show you that in a couple slides. And as I, I think uh, Phil talked about earlier, th this, this project list that we have is not your wish list. So some of the things that are in here uh, are your typical CIP with those with those legacy projects on top. And there are some issues, you know, with, you know, are we keeping up with the items that, you know, are, are in your standard CIP? Are we keeping up with all the things that need to be um, uh, reconstructed? Are we falling behind? That's some of the things that I think maybe, you know, some staff information will tell you whether you're keeping up on your maintenance of some of your infrastructure. But at this point, this, this really says, we're just gonna keep doing it the same we are. Uh, for the CIP, whether that's right or not, I, I think that's something to determine. And then we added on those legacy projects. So I won't go into de too much detail on these two these p two pages with the uh, uh, sizing of the issues. I'll go on to page nine. Yes. Okay. So what we wanted to do is kind of show you with the current list that the staff has provided us. How can we fit that within a, a certain structure and have a stable tax rate? So we took your list. And, and knowing that we were at a 2023 tax rate, which using an estimated value for 1-1 one, one of 22, it really gives you a debt service tax rate for next year of $1.36 per thousand of equalized value. And that's the number, you know, it's based on how we, we did the issue for you a couple weeks or about a month or so ago. Um, and, and really when we got up to $1.36, we were starting to implement that five-year plan uh, as far as building up to an amount that would be a, um, uh, a sustainable, flexible number. So there was already a start to getting you to a point where you're, you have a tax rate that's starting to be a little bit more flexible. You know, when you look at the plan, the, the existing debt really shows that you have 10-year debt. It falls off really fast. Um, some of, the, some of the things that are in here that are kind of our assumptions is, you know, there's some TID closures that you approved recently. You'll see that in the value column that we have some decent uh, growth because of those closures. Otherwise, we have a 2% annual growth going forward. And without any TID closures for 2022's tax levy, uh, that 2% growth was about right on target. You had about a 2.5% increase. 
Um, one thing that we also considered in here is that interest rates have been climbing. I think when I stood here for the, the borrowing issue, uh, we were talking about the rates going up. Really, interest rates have gone up about 10 basis points, which is 0 0.10% uh, basically each week for the entire year. So uh, right now, if you looked at what the rates were like back in January, we're about at 1.60% uh, higher than we were at the beginning of the year, basically all along the maturity line. So it, it's, you know, and it hasn't slowed. Um, so what we'll, we'll show you on the next page is we set up a structure to stabilize the taxes. And I think that's best shown by moving them. You guys are ahead of me on this one. Uh, so moving across this sort of like uh, Phil did with the base plan, that first box on the left is really what he showed you. It's a summarized version of the base plan. It shows you where, you're, where you are today, it shows you that $1.36 I just talked about, which was the product of after the 22 borrowing. Then we took the, tw the 10 years of issues, and this is the pink column is really the summary of all of the structuring we did of the, of the principal for that 10 years of projects. And then the next columns are what is paid by other uh, funding sources. So in this case, it was the TIF districts have a few projects that are within your capital list. Taking that away from the amount that the existing debt plus the new debt uh, had, you get your net debt service re levy, which is about five or six in from there. So where we're at 4.4 million after the 22 borrowing, well, we'd be potentially up around 5.3 million. But what I really want to have your attention go to is that green box. I think it's green. It's light green up there. It's a little darker on the paper. But what we did is we said, okay, if we take your 10 years of projects, can we, what, what kind of a rate can we have and what's the lowest tax rate we can have and have it be stable and be able to fit that 10 years of projects in? And so $1.52 is where we're holding. Uh, and so since we only had 10 years of projects, we're, we're holding that $1.52. Uh, per thousand of equalized value, um, and we're doing that through 2033, then we don't have any projects in our list. So if we had an 11th year, we would be structuring the debt payments to be at $1.52 that year. But what you can see is how fast that drops off. You really have a lot of flexibility to add those projects when we get to year 11. So that's why you see that tax levy dropping down. Um, what we've also shown you is, is really the impact on that taxpayer once we hit that level that we feel it, it stabilizes what it takes to, to do your projects. You'll see that the taxpayer doesn't really have an impact uh, from year to year with this type of a structuring. So, you know, we go up to about $16 uh, per 100,000 value property in 2024, and then we basically hold steady for that year. And we would try to do that same thing even after the 10 year when we have the new, newer projects come on. You know, would that tax rate go up? There are things that would ha make that happen. If rates keep going up the way they are, we might have to adjust that. If you have another legacy project that we don't have in there, that would make that happen. If there's infrastructure projects that have been put off where we're trying to catch up to, you know, whether we do enough streets each year or something like that, it could be that that's not the lowest number right now, but it's something that you know, we can come back with that if you have, you know, if you instruct staff to kind of come up with, uh, you know, maybe not a wish list, but maybe something that uh, keeps you in line with what you need to do for maintenance purposes. So I think you know that the biggest takeaway here is how do we stabilize that tax rate? And as you know, with levy limits, the operating is already pretty much held flat. If we can also flatten out the debt tax rate, we can we can have basically do our projects have a stable tax bill for each, each taxpayer and get the projects that you want done. So that's really the thrust behind this plan. And then the next page, page 11, is just how that plan that you have right now affects your debt policy. So the city has an internal debt policy that you won't go above 60% of what's the overall debt limit uh, set by the state, which is 5% of your equalized value. That's how much you could borrow totally. Uh, when we talk to our clients, and, and they're all different sizes, you know, we tell them not to go about 75%. You have more value here. You are able to take on your projects and keep that number down. Your policy that was established, I think, quite a while ago is at 60%. You'll see that the plan gets up to about 35% in 2026. Um, but that, like I said, like we talked about, this is this is the status quo CIP. It could be that, you know, if we were to plug in a few few more million for streets or whatever that number is, 
uh, or other projects that may not be included, you know, we might be closer to that line. So it's something that at least you know you have capacity if there's other projects that aren't accounted for. I think I've, I've basically talked about the page 11 or page 12, you know, your policy is 60%. Um, with the projects that are included in what the staff gave us, it's at about 36%. Uh, you know, you could consider adjusting that policy or uh, have us come back with another uh, plan with some numbers that maybe are, are uh, take into account some of the things that the departments might be able to share with you. Uh, the other thing would be is, uh, you know, this also assumes that the financing of the utility debt is done through revenue debt and that we're not including their stuff. So that's just a kind of an add on just to know, let you know that this does not include any utility projects. So. I've said quite a bit and, and Phil addressed the table pretty good to get me started into the details, but I, we're happy to answer any questions. Questions from Alders? Alder Prello. Thank you so much for the presentation. I just want to understand in a few words. Um, so you took the, some of the capital projects for the next 10 years. First of all, how did you do that? Um, I mean, we, we, we have a CIP for five years, right? So how did you scale it up to 10 years? So the city provided us with a five-year plan to begin with, and, and we actually had that ready to go to come see you. Uh, but there was a bunch of projects that, that were brought to our attention. Another list was provided by staff, and that's where the additional uh, five years, which would be harbor projects, uh, transit building, uh, remodel okay. fire station, those other items that so, they brought to us. Yeah, the staff provided it. Okay. Yep. So then um, do you have a projection? So we have a projection of the capital needed, and you made a projection of the uh, the debt needed, I mean, the the uh, the borrowing needed mm -hmm. and the impact on the taxi, the tax levy on thousand per thousand, correct? Yeah, it's, it's the yeah. tax levy rate that we have in here is per thousand of equalized value, which would be like your market value of your home or property. Right. So, and that that in in this last page, the the debt service tax rate is in addition to what the current tax levy is. No, no. So is that you're, total? At, you're, you're going to be you're at a dollar twenty two right now. After the after the borrowing you did in twenty twenty two, you'll be closer to one one dollar and thirty six cents. So that's only uh, like twelve cents more, fourteen cents more. Oh, okay. So really, we're going to go. We're, we're proposing that you go from a dollar twenty two to a dollar fifty two. So thirty cents. Very good, but the debt. Thank you for the clarification. But then the the debt itself. Um, obviously, it's not going to be exhausted in 10 years, right? So you made the calculation. So I, I'm just trying to understand, why did you calculate it on 10 years? No, what we tried to do is stabilize the tax rate for all 10 years. Oh, okay. So really, if, if you had given us a 25-year list, we would have had a dollar fifty-two for each year if that's, what it, if that's what it took to do that, you know, all the way down to 2056 on here. So it's just that we only had 10 years of projects, and so we're stabilizing the tax rate for the years we know. If you had given us 11th year, we would have structured to $1.52 again. And so really, you're just holding steady the whole way down is what, what the plan would be. Very good. Thank you so much. Other questions from Alders? Alder Flicky paneski Thank you. Um, I am looking at the debt limit chart. Sure. And if I'm reading this correctly, we are borrowing approximately half of the borrowing power we could do. Is that accurate? At this time, the total amount of outstanding general obligation debt you have is at about half of that, yes. And you would hold at that level. So you're, you're pretty much holding at that level. Okay, so when you start to calculate $1.52 of equalized value, does that move the green part closer to the top of the red line? I missed the first part of that. If, if you raise the debt limit to the, the levy limit to a buck 52 instead of where it is now, 
So per thousand. We we factor in we factored in a two percent growth each year. Is that and, your... and that two percent growth? So as you moves. as you see the blue line growing, that's the growth in the equalized value. So your equalized value times five percent is your statutory number, and so we have that top line growing by two percent each year, which is representative of your past growth. So the top line will move and the green line will stay stable. I'm trying to get the relationship. Yeah, so between. so let's say let's say that the, the top line continues to grow and you have the same amount of debt outstanding each you know at the end of each year your total amount of outstanding amount stays the same. Okay. Then the green line would be separating from the blue line. The blue line would be pulling yes. away from it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. Next, we'll do uh, mayor's announcements. Oh, mayor. No. Oh, anyone for public forum? No one this evening. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Now I'll do my presentation. Uh, Scott, can you pull up my PowerPoint? I'm kidding. That was a joke. So. <laughs> um, all right. Can I have four, former Alderman Marcus Savaglio come on down? Um, so as you all obviously know, um, former Alderman Marcus Savaglio has resigned from the council. Um, and him and I uh, are trauma bonded, if you will. Um, in a sense that we were both elected to the Common Council um, at the same time five years ago. Um, obviously, it's been good reasons why uh, Elder Savalio has resigned. Um, his family is growing. He bought a new house uh, in a new district. Um, his wife, Jillian, is here. They just had uh, the, uh, a, uh, a girl, right? Yep. So um, a healthy family, so, so they're exciting. Their family is growing. So as we always do with outgoing elders, we wanted to present... Um, older person Marcus Savalio with five years of dedicated service to the city of Sheboygan, April 18th, 20, 2017 to May 4th, 2022. So there you go. Any parting words that you'd like to say? Of course. Um, Scott, if you wouldn't mind pulling up my presentation, I'd really appreciate that. <laughs> okay, you can't use my jokes. Oh, it, it, was, it was too good. It was yeah. too good. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Mayor, for a acknowledging my service to the city of Sheboygan. I've been blessed that I get to raise my family here, that I've been able to start a business here, and that I've been able to call Sheboygan home. Over the past five years I, uh, on the council, I've watched our city focus on, focus on what matters most, roads, housing, good paying jobs, and creating a vibrant community with many things to do. I'm glad that I was able to lend my ideas and thoughts to help guide a talented group of city staff members behind me, out there, at Public Works, everywhere. I'm also thankful <clears throat> for all the hours I have spent learning from and growing with my fellow alder persons, with the city staff, and with residents of our community in the pursuit of a better Sheboygan for all of our residents. Now, none of my service would have been possible without the support of my, and sacrifices of my beautiful family, especially my amazingly supportive wife, Jillian. Thank you for all you have done and, and for our kids and for me. I look forward to serving this community in the future, and I cannot wait to see what Sheboygan does next. On one final note, Chad over here has a wealth of information in his head. I'm pretty sure he put together most of the two presentations that Braden mentioned tonight. Chad, I would love if you were to redo the, the, the zoning code for us and just tell them what to do, <coughs> because they will listen to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, and have a great night, everyone. Well, I, I, I'm sure Marcus will still be around in some capacity in, in the community, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see him around. We, we appreciate his dedication to this community as well. All right, next, uh, could I have uh, Police Chief Chris Domagowski come on down? All right, so we have a proclamation uh, to, to present uh, today. 
Um, whereas there are more than 800,000 law enforcement officers serving our community across the United States, including the dedicated members of the Sheboygan Police Department. And whereas since the first recorded death in 1786, more than 23,000 law enforcement officers in the United States have made the ultimate sacrifice and have been killed in the line of duty, including two members in the Sheboygan Police Department. Whereas the names of these dedicated public service officials are engraved in the walls of the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C., and whereas 619 new names of fallen heroes have been added to the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial this spring, including 472 officers killed in 2021 and 147 officers killed the previous year. And whereas May 15th is designated as Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor for all fallen officers and their families, and the U.S. flag will be flown at half staff. And now I, therefore, Ryan Sorensen, by, by authority vested in me as mayor of Sheboygan, do hereby proclaim May 11th through 7th, the 17th, 2022, as National Police Week. And throughout the city of Sheboygan, publicly salute the services of all our law enforcement officers in our communities and communities across the country. So I'll present this to Chris Tomagowski. Any words or? Yeah, yeah I'd just like to say um, thank you to the mayor and all of you for your support. And then as part of Police Week, there's a countywide law enforcement memorial service on Thursday in front of the courthouse at 11 a.m. Um, everyone's invited. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Chief. All right, well, today is Monday, uh, the 16th still, um, and it is bike, to bike and walk to work week. Um, this this week. So uh, in, a f in true fashion, in a full suit and tie, I rode my bike uh, to City Hall uh, this morning. Um, so there's a lot of great programming that the Sheboygan Active Transportation Committee um, is doing throughout the community. So follow them on different social media platforms as well. Um, if you bike or walk to work um, and on your way, you want to stop at Paradigm Coffee House um, in the Uptown uh, parking Parklet uh, anytime between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. they're handing out free coffee and uh, treats as well too. So I got my fix this morning um, on my way into work. Um, May 30th is Memorial Day. Um, so we'll pay tribute to those that have lost their lives in the line of duty protecting our freedom and democracy um, in this country. So uh, as usual the parade will be at 9 a.m. Um, following the parade there'll be a, a program at Fountain Park as well. Um, in May is Young Professionals Month. So check out the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce, their website. They got a lot of different programming activities for young professionals and young professionals at heart. So those are my announcements for this evening. Thanks, everyone. All right. Now we'll discuss the consent, uh, consent agenda, items 11 through 2020, or 22, excuse me. I was say 2022, I was like, we don't have that many items on the agenda. Alder Feldy. Thank you, I'll try to stay on track this time. I move to receive and file all ROs, receive all RCs, and adopt all resolutions and ordinances. Second. Then a motion second, any items for discussion on the consent agenda? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Please refer to your muni code. Just give a thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> there you go. We'll get you set up. Yeah. <laughs> Ten eyes. All right, consent agenda is approved. Next is report of officers. Items 23 through 28 will be referred to the respective committees. Next, item 29, resolutions. Resolution number 172223 by Elder Persons Feldy and Flicky Paneski, amending resolution number 732122, adopted on October 8th, 2021, establishing the wards and boundaries for the city of Sheboygan. Alder Feldy. Thank you, Mayor. 
I ask to suspend the rules. Any objection to suspension? Seeing none, please proceed. I move to adopt the resolution. Second. There's been a motion and second. Any discussion on this item? Alder Perella. Why are we adopting it now? City Clerk. It was adopted in October. However, the state redrew the assembly line. And when they did that, it went through some of our wards. So we had to create new wards. It split ward number 9, 10, and 17. So we had to add some new wards. So this is an additional change to the one that already have been done that we are aware of. Right. So we adopted the one in October. Right. And then they changed the line for the assembly, or they adopted a line for the assembly in that split award. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Additional comments? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Please refer to your Muni code. Ten eyes. All right, that item is approved. Items 30 through 35 will be referred to their respective committees. Next is report of committees. RC number 12223 by the Finance and Personnel Committee to whom was referred resolution 2-2223 by older persons Mitchell and Flicky Paneski authorizing a transfer and establishing an internship program within the mayor's office budget. Alder Mitchell. Thank you, Mayor. I move to uh, receive the RC and adapt the resolution. Second. There's been a motion second. Any alders wishing to speak? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Please refer to your muni code. Ten eyes. All right, that item is approved. Item 37, RC number 22223 by the Finance and Personnel Committee to whom was referred resolution number 72223 by older persons Mitchell and Flicky Paneski authorizing the issuance and sale of up to <laughs> 39 million four hundred thirty thousand and eighteen dollars to the water utility revenue <coughs> bonds series 2022 providing for other details in covenants with respective there too. Alder Mitchell. Well, thank you, Mayor. I move to receive the RC and adopt the resolution. Second. There's been a motion and second. Any discussion on this item? All right. This is a roll call vote. Please refer to your muni code. Ten eyes. That item is approved. Item 38 will be referred to the Licensing Hearing and Public Safety Committee. We've exhausted the agenda. Thank God. Alder Feldy. I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor of adjourning, please state aye. 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 Any opposition? We are adjourned. For those at home, we're adjourning the council meeting, but the next half of our programming will begin for committee the whole meeting. So. <laughs> So we're adjourned for the council meeting. Can we get a five minute reset?